Right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a brand new episode of the RGM Experience podcast with me, Carl Malone. We're here again and join another week of music with a, with a guest, ladies and gentlemen. And this guy needs no introduction at all. It's Miles Hunt. Morning, mate. How are you doing? I'm very well. Yeah, how you doing, Carl? Yeah, fine. Thanks. Yeah, I'm brilliant. Thanks. I'm just getting over an operation. I've had a I've had a little tu- a thing put in me because I'm getting older and, you know, the excesses of booze and that over the years. <laughs> I've had to have a little thing put around my tube to stop acid reflux coming up. So that's been nice. Oh, God. All right. <laughs> have you, yeah. have you, have you have, I, uh, after a few years on the pop yourself, have you had to have anything medical, mate? No, I haven't. I've been very lucky. <laughs> um, I do get the old acid reflux. Well, yeah. if I stick to the diet that I figured yes. out about a year ago, I don't. <laughs> But if I eat bread yeah. at any point in the day, I will have crazy indigestion. So I don't really eat bread anymore. Do you, love, you still love bread, though? Uh, no, not for about a year and a half now. Yeah. I've been trying not to eat it, and I, yeah. I do other things. So um, yeah. I don't really miss it now. But <laughs> occasionally, if I'm a little bit hungover, I'm like, ah, a bit of Marmite on toast. There we go. Uh, but it does. <laughs> but it does. <laughs> Well, just so you know, mate, I've, I've been a Wonderstuff fan since I was 13 and I'm 40. Wow. I was okay. past I was past a little red tape with eight leg groove machine back on at school when I was 13. Uh-huh. And I, I was given another tape, like, well, like a box of tape. This kid gave me loads of tapes and new music to listen to. I had you, I had the wedding present on that I'm interviewing later this week as well. So this week's, it's kind of, uh, I'm kind of like impressed with myself that I'm speaking to you guys uh, yeah, nice. and you're joining me on the podcast. So you're very much welcome uh, to the RGM family and we appreciate your time, mate. I just wanted to start off with that. Oh, uh, cool. Yeah, my pleasure. Well, you know, my first experience of the band was, you know, the, the big gigs that you had back in, in back in the 90s. So the Best Scott Stadium, Phoenix Festival. Mm-hmm. You know, how, how, how would you look back on those times now when you, you know, now 30 odd years have passed and you... Well, it's, it's funny now because both of those uh, gigs that you mentioned, Phoenix and Bescott, of course, were filmed. Mm. And so really my memory of them is affected by the fact that, of course, the the, the moments themselves only lasted 90 minutes. Yeah. Um, and so my actual memories have completely faded. I, it's, yeah. it's quite weird if I see any of that footage, you know, people put those things up on social media. And it's for me, it's like looking at somebody else. It, it's not like mm. I'm looking at me. Um, and so I see them now from the perspective of having seen them filmed, really. I, I don't really remember yeah. much of them at all. Still, you know, like those big iconic stadiums have stuck with me throughout my life. And I can remember during the Phoenix Festival, you announced that this is going to be the Wonderstuff's last ever gig back in 1994 at the time. Yeah, well, that wasn't our idea because we well, knew we, we'd split up. Yeah. Um, we split up in the middle of the construction for the Modern Idiot Tour, mm. so the year before. Um, mm. So we knew we were dumb. And, and what we thought was the most sensible thing to do was not say it, but they had our friends knew, mm. and the record company knew. Um, but, you, you know, we'd seen so many other bands split up and reform. We just thought we won't, we won't announce it. But then the Phoenix Festival itself, the tickets weren't going that great. Mm. And word had got around, so our agent knew, our managers knew. And so Vince Power, who was the promoter on Phoenix, um, he very politely asked, you know, look, this would really help the festival out. If you announced it was your last show, we might sell some more tickets. Mm. And I was very much in the, well, I really don't care. It doesn't matter. <laughs> so, yeah, if that helps Vince, go ahead. So that's really how it, it, it was, didn't really come from the band. And I, I'd stop caring at that point. I just wanted a different yeah. life. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, just looking back over the times and everything and wondering, um, you know, what, what's ahead for you at that point is it feels like you're kind of at that kind of place in your life now with music. Uh, yeah, I suppose I am. Yeah, for the second time, I want to make some changes. Yeah. Um, I think back then, I I knew that I, I still wanted to pursue music in one form or another, whether I would go into production, whether I would form another band. Uh, I sort of did both. Um, but straight away after Phoenix, I'd been offered a job at um, MTV Europe. 
I was going to say, yeah, because you, you turned up on MTV with no hair and everybody's like, <laughs> yeah. double taken. Is that, is that really Miles Hunt? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's yeah. Really- so I knew the people there quite well because I lived around the corner from the office mm. and the studios. And I'd been in that the MTV Europe had been incredibly supportive on, particularly on the fourth Wonder Stuff album, Construction. So I seemed like I was in there all the time anyway. And um, Paul King, uh, he resigned from the 120 minutes job to go over to VH1. And Catalina, the producer, who I'd sort of got a little bit friendly with, she said, would you be interested? And at first it wasn't anything I was interested in, but I was like, okay, I'll go for a, sc- I won't get the job. I'll, I'll, I'll go for the screen test. And, and they offered it me like a few days later. And I'm like, oh, shit. So it's a, a real butterfly in the stomach moment, which I thought was healthy because I never, I used to get anxious about going on stage with the wonder stuff. I still do, but I'm not nervous. Like I'm, I'm not in fear that something is going to go wrong because I completely trusted in the other members of the band. I thought, I I always thought we were well rehearsed enough to have the audacity to go on stage. (laughs) Uh, So I was never nervous, but there was a certain anxiety that that would come with it. Um, But, once I started thinking, am I really going to do this MTV job? I actually got very, very nervous about it. And I thought, well, I think that's a good thing. I think that's good for me. Um, so, so let's plow ahead. So I did it. Um, I really enjoyed uh, working with the people at MTV. I never, ever got comfortable in front of the camera. I, I was hoping I would. It, but I did it for over a year and I never did. I, I, that nervousness always stayed there. And once I'm in a nervous state of mind, I can't, I can't hold on to information. So if I'm um, interviewing a, a band or an artist, um, particularly if it's a band and an art, if it's a band and an artist that I love, mm. the information stays in there. Yeah. But if it's well, in the case of point of things like on the Elastica, and I, I just <laughs> you know I, I I've got a terrible story about my Elastica interview. I fell asleep during <laughs> yeah. the interview. Come on, let's, really, take back, let's get into this one absolutely true poor justine frischman is <laughs> horrified i mean i was incredibly hung over <laughs> and i just had no interest in the band there was nothing about them yeah. that i thought was remotely interesting and, and so she's answering one of my piss poor questions and i nodded off yeah. so that wasn't good um and i suppose i was always nervous of you know i'd been in a band so i knew what a gang mentality was to deal with and i was very much on my own um so yeah I, ne- I never got i'm actually feeling quite jittery about even thinking about it but um oh, yeah. so yeah i um i was disappointed that i didn't take to it better that they wanted me to stay yeah and they were pleased with me uh but yeah i couldn't i, I just thought i can't live like this i'm a fucking nervous wreck all the time <laughs> and uh so so now um it's on under very different circumstances i suppose now um I've always enjoyed the process of making records. And I think a, a, a record these days takes me about 18 months to put it together from yeah. writing an initial bunch of ideas, uh, asking various musicians that I know, be them members of the Wonder Stuff or other friends, if if they would chip in and have got any ideas. I like working with producers, um, you know, trying out different things, kicking ideas mm-hmm. around. and. But it takes a long time and it and it ends up costing way more money <laughs> than you try. I mean, the last Wonder Stuff album cost us like I think it was about forty five grand wow. to make it. And you're like, How how is it this? And you're like, Oh yeah. One of them lives in Paris, one of them lives in Los <laughs> Angeles. We're in a studio for God knows how many weeks. Yeah. So you pay the producer, the engineer, and it adds up and you've got yeah. a accommodation for everybody. So this one, I thought well, I ain't going to do that. And and so the, the very disappointing thing nowadays is is spending this sort of money on records is you can't get it back. Mm. Uh, people don't buy physical formats in the way that they used to. So I'm very much against streaming or the, the current, um, the way it currently works that seems that the record labels are fine because they just go for quantity over quality. So as long as they're just throwing loads of shit out there, whether it's new artists or or back catalogues, they're still earning. Spotify, of course, take the biggest chunk. Um, and the artists who are actually providing the content, uh, writers and musicians, mm. we've been sold down the river by our publishers, by major record labels. No one stood up for the artists. And um, I just, I can't uh, in all good conscience 
um, I just can't join in with it. So knowing how, so this record's cost me about nine or 10 grand. I've yeah. pulled a lot, lot of favors on this solo album. So I managed to keep it way down. So just, but it's, but it's unlikely I'll get that back because people, I mean, I won't put it on a streaming service, maybe in a, a year or two's time I might. Uh, so we make physical vinyl and C CDs to hopefully get some of that back. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, I was, just I was, I was to speaking to all that. We'll all of those. So. I, I was speaking to the Skinner brothers, Zach from a, a new band, who's like, you know, just starting off, just starting to get on festivals, and just you know, at the, at the, you know, it's starting to happen for him. It feels like, and mm -hmm. he's looking for where the money is to to make yeah. ends meet and to to pay for these shitty hotel rooms they're staying in, and yeah. kind of so just so they can survive on the road and just eat while they're out there. Yeah, uh, and, it, and you know, it's, we had a chat about Spotify just being this this massive monopoly, where where, the, where there's monopoly rules on businesses and that kind of stuff. Why isn't the one to do with streaming sites where this, this Spotify and Apple music, have got so much power over everything. Yeah. It's not right. Is it? Well, and they don't create any content, you know, I mean, mm. that's, that's what I find fascinating, but yeah. it's, it's to, to me from the way I understood it, that it happened, it's entirely in the hands of the publishers and, and the record labels that, that were around yeah. to allow. I understand why they did what they did, but essentially the way I understand it is they were, the labels were playing whack-a-mole basically with stream, illegal streaming sites. There were just so many of them. So every, so you, got, you know, you had LimeWire and various other things. So then they would get a legal team together, the labels would, and try and shut them down. And, and in most cases, Napster and the like, mm -hmm. they successfully would just, you know, get rid of them. But as soon as you got rid of that one, another one or two or three or 10 would come along. So it was a game of whack-a-mole, like you're hitting that one down and here comes another one. Then Spotify came along and rather than going live, they built their platform stole all of the content and then went to the labels and said, this is the deal we're offering you. Yeah. And they accepted it. And the way, obviously the labels are then like, okay, so we've got rid of manufacturing. We've got rid of, um, distribution. So there's huge savings for them there. And if we just buy up catalogs that become available and sign new artists for pennies, I mean, I, I know young new bands that have signed to huge names in the music mm -hmm. business, you know, EMI and, and, and the likes, uh, but they, they all have to have a, a day job. The bands all still have to have a day job. I mean, we were lucky enough to come from an era where they, a label Polydor in our case would give you enough money to come off the dole or give up your job and concentrate entirely on the band and gig your asses off and write as much as you could. But those days are well and truly over. So, uh, it's so depressing, isn't it? <laughs> mm -hmm. It didn't need to change. It was a good business model. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, and you yeah. bringing up like a young band that you know, for, for instance, when we did our second independent single, which is unbearable, um, I don't know the exact numbers. It'd be less than 10,000. Let's say it's about, you know, seven inches and 12 inches between three and 5,000. So you give those to a distributor and within a month, we got enough money coming back from that to buy a van, mm. which meant we were making savings on not hiring vans. So we could tour all the time and, you know, you could become self-sufficient, um, in that manner. I mean, there's arguably there's still ways of doing it now. Um, I you know, pressing up those things and selling them independently, but the outlets are very small. Uh, and then bizarrely, the other thing that's grown is, you know, it used to be two or three monthly magazines and two or three weekly uh, music papers. Mm. And those are your outlets. Well, there's fucking billions of them now. <laughs> so yeah. It, it, how do you know if the enemy gave you a great review that had a serious effect yeah. on you? Well, now there are no sort of market leaders in that way, which in many ways is good, but there's no f focal point for people to go oh. to and go, okay, what's the great record out this week? Well, you make your choices, don't you? It could be your podcast, it could be somebody else's. Yeah. But, um, so we, we, we try and model ourselves on like Louder Than War and yeah. I've got a lot of friends over at Loud, Louder Than War that we try and emulate our gem to be something like a bit punk and a bit, you know, trying to have a voice and try and help as many people along the way. Um, it's just, That's kind of where we sit with it really. And, and yeah. 
we, we try and not give and to say everything's great in the world and it's not we try and be honest mm-hmm. even with people that are starting off that don't like that they're not used to that <laughs> Yeah. When, when they get a review, it's the friends telling them they're great. Where we'll we'll be independent about it and tell them, look, lads, you can do better here. Yeah, thing. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like I say, there's lots of good things about it, but essentially, digitization and the internet killed yes. what was what was a great business model. Yeah. It worked, and I just think you know it's an obvious one for the tech giants to get in on and just nick stuff and, and destroy a great little industry with zero passion for mm. music or, or people's talent. Uh, and it's just the passion for making money. And of course, three minutes of music that you can stream very easily rather than streaming a movie. It was an easy thing for them to do. And they just mm-hmm. they just raped the industry and never really gave a thought to who creates the content. Yeah. No, that, I... That's the bit that uh, boils my piss. So, <laughs> um, so my choice to sort of knock it on the head yeah. um, is very different uh you know it's for very different reasons than i did in the mid 90s um yeah so what i'm, was I'm the not reasons, gonna what was the reasons in the mid 90s i didn't like the success <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. we were we were too successful we were too busy we were t- too much in uh, each other's company yeah uh, and i just wanted what we should have done perhaps is it was offered to us from polydor they said you know we'll, we'll give you an amount of money to take an, an absolute year off Mm. So don't go to rehearsals, don't write, don't demo, don't gig, uh, and and then let's um, let's reconvene in a year. But I didn't like that idea because I knew that I would constantly be. My life hasn't really changed; it's just paused for a bit. Yeah. Uh, so I, I refused that very kind offer because mm. um, they'd done that with various other Polydor artists. I think the boss told me they'd done that with the Cure when when they weren't particularly happy it was like have a year off kind of thing but anyway we didn't we didn't make that choice so um and the band just got i don't care about the fucking music industry in (laughs) in, you know in so much as i i don't care about competing yeah uh and and when you got to the level that we were at i mean we far from broke america but we toured there a lot and we had a decent relationship with the label but of course they would be looking at things like u2 in excess and going to us well this could be you, you know, if you really knuckle down and, and I'm like, it's not an aspiration I have. I, to, to me, their lives are ruined by their success. I would hate to be the guy that can't walk down the street. You that, know? That, that, that footage of you in New York playing room 512. Yeah. Just like, it's, it's always, it, it still remains my favorite song to this very day, that song. And that's when mm. I first, that's when I first saw it. Uh, and experience that song live you on the streets of new york just playing that song to everybody walking past yeah yeah that, that yeah whole, it's good that, that's that, that's footprinted in my musical history and line yeah, nice oh, mate. but yeah what you're doing with something like that is um you know we did things because like, we enjoyed it but uh, mm. everything that we were doing and encouraged to do and willingly went along with is trying to build this monstrous successful beast and I think by about 1994, I'm just like, actually, I don't want my life to be that. I, I'm quite happy playing sort of 300, 500 capacity clubs. Yeah. My eye isn't on stadiums and, and enormous theatres. It was, it never was. They, you know, I, I've never paid to go to a stadium gig. I've, I, I just, I'm just not interested. Mm-hmm. And when I look at like huge bands now that. Uh, so if I have a look at Glastonbury or you see stuff online and, and the sets, you know, the lights, the screens, it's just preposterous. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, that I'm about as interested in that as I am Formula One, which I'm not remotely <laughs> interested in Formula One. It just to me, it's not that's not what music's about. Yeah. You know, for my taste anyway. So, I, I, it, it just like, you know, the wonder stuff. I, it, I started watching the band in the 90s i think it was the lead and all the first live gig i saw yeah mm-hmm. the last time i saw you were at the ritz the other month in manchester yeah so like you know the energy and the performance of the band has been similar but there's different faces there now mm-hmm. so what you know having that idea of you know of packing it in and stopping what's carried you on over those 30 years to keep coming back and and working hard and rehearsing with new people to keep to keep the thing going really what, what well, made you carry on i like the gigging i, I mm. the gigging i probably I, will, I certainly won't stop gigging with the wonder stuff mm. i i think this is the greatest lineup that we've had 
in terms of musicianship and the fact that uh, you know we've we've all known each other a long long time you know mm. um but the musicianship and the personalities in the band and the age we're at it all works yeah. um, and we purely do it because we enjoy the actual playing you know it's a really nice thing to do um it's lovely to see mount back as well it was a shame yeah at the ritz when he were too ill to to play that one and <laughs> oh, of course, on the yeah. last tour, yeah 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 that was rotten for him but he came back by the end and we'll we'll yeah. we'll tour next year uh the uk anyway okay. and uh and i'm gonna do acoustic shows um next month november and december just to bring a little bit of attention to this record that i've made uh but in terms of spending 18 months on, on another record whether it's a solo record or a wonder stuff record i'm just like there's no point it, or you know mm. i may as well just set fire to a load of money and yeah. I've, I've sort of always maintained that i write and create music for my pleasure like i i'm not trying to write a hit um i'm, I'm not trying the, the point of it is isn't to entertain people it's to entertain me and that's how I've always been. That that's why I make music. And you know, something like the hit we had with Sides of a Cow, that just happened to be one idea and it became very popular. Mm. And it had, you know, a real sort of commercial flavour to it. But when I wrote that, it wasn't like of course Polydor were like, Well, yeah, write another ten of them. Like, <laughs> I've got no way. Well, I don't know how to. That's just the song yeah. that came to me that day. It'll be a different style of song that comes to me on mm. another day. So um, so I've always just been making music that I want to hear. Um, and I'll, I can continue to do that, whether it's just me sitting on the sofa mm. with an acoustic guitar or whether I can be asked to sit in front of the computer and build up some beats and bass lines and, and all that type of stuff. But I just, I'd never see myself making a commercial um, or, or releasing a record commercially again. Uh, my ego doesn't need it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, so I'll, I'll keep doing gigs when people want me to, but it, I do other things now and I've been, I've been working this summer for, uh, for a local real ale brewery, mm -hmm. uh, called the three tons brewery nearby where I live. I'm a, uh, I totally endorse the product. <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I've been delivering barrels of beers to pubs, uh, mm -hmm. three days a week and I love it, you know, all, all around mid Wales, Shropshire. It, go as far as Birmingham and places like that. And I felt worthwhile. It's kept me fit. Uh, I love the people that I see in the mornings and the afternoon at the brewery when I pick up and bring the empties back. And I haven't been this content and happy for fucking years mm. um, to doing something worthwhile. And um, so I'm going to take a bit of time off from that while I do these gigs, but I intend to go back and do that again next year. Yeah. Well, one thing I've always enjoyed is, and, and, and there's not many of them because it, it sounds like you don't really like doing interviews that much or you don't seem to have done a lot through the years, but when, whenever I've seen you on the telly or the radio or whatever, what, one thing I've always enjoyed is how honest you are and um, how opinionated you can be as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I, I was talking to the lottery winners the other day and I first saw the lottery winners live supporting you at Manchester Academy with, uh, with, uh, with Erica. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all those shows and the lottery winners were supporting you, so so I asked. It, it, that's always been like a memory of mine, like going to gigs and stuff. So when I was speaking to Tom and that, I just said, you know, "What kind of advice have you had for Milo through the years?" And he's like, "Oh, he's like me, Dad. Yeah, he's all excited and that when 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 your name comes up, um, and you know, you, you had a massive impact on giving him advice. And what what did what did what advice did he give you then? What what did he say to you? And he just said, "Be yourself, man." Yeah. Don't, let, don't let the bastards drag you down and <laughs> just fucking what are they, these record labels say to you just be yourself and it's lovely to see those guys just all over the place at the minute absolutely fucking enjoying every minute of their journey yeah i mean they're a brilliant band they're a wonderful bunch of characters yeah. really talented i think any audience they get in front of just fall in love with tom because yeah. he's just such a wonderful character on well, he's a wonderful character in real yeah. life as well hmm. um yeah i i i think it think it's great but you know what i notice most of all when i'm around tom and the rest of the people in the band is how much energy they've got and i i just <laughs> don't have that i you know i'm fucking 56. i don't have that energy and drive to make music i've been doing it all my life you know and i'm i'm, 
I'm 56 and I've had, I've been lucky enough to have all the experiences that I ever dreamed I'd get out of it. Yeah. Um, and then I don't feel it's not in me that like I need it, that I need to keep doing it. I, I like I say, that, that wonder stuff tour in June, other than Mount being ill for three or four mm. of the shows. Um, brilliant. I love every second of it. I love being with the band. I, I love being on a tour bus. I love being in front of the audiences. I feel very comfortable, but if it all had to go away tomorrow, it wouldn't break my heart. It's like, Christ, I've had four yeah. decades out of this. So do you, do you feel jaded of, no. of, 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 through it now? No, no, not at all. I, I feel very fortunate. I suppose it, it <laughs> would be the word if I was to review it all. I'm yeah. incredibly fortunate to, to have done it. Um, uh, I, I know I the Holy Grail to make a career out of the music industry and it to, to have gone through it. There's not many people like yourself that have survived the journey. Well, yeah, there's, there's a lot of a lot of luck involved, a lot of support, uh, and particularly, you know, it's amazing the support that the Wonder Stuff managed to get with a singer like a mouth, you know, with a mouth like mine. You know, I just uh, if you ask me, like you said earlier, if you ask me a question, I'll give you my honest answer. I'm, I'm not trying to hoodwink any anybody about anything. So uh, we did. We I just, there's still people in the in industry that are uh, that are powerful that would go out of their way not to do the wonder stuff a favor because of things I've said in the past, but uh, <laughs> I guess I'm not a businessman. I was never trying to forge a career. Yep. I didn't have my eye on the prize. It's all very much about what are we doing right now? <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's, I, I've, I've had a good time. Yeah. Yeah, man. And, you, and you, you've been really prolific through the years, you know, all the books that, you know, that, that are all on sale now that I've been flicking. Yeah. Through. Yeah. I've got, I've got all three of them cool yeah i enjoyed doing that just, yeah they, they were just great and they must have took a bit a bit of time uh as well in between records and stuff i think they took right. about a year to write all three yeah uh but i thoroughly enjoyed it and that was a sort of another experiment it wasn't just about telling the story of the wonder stuff there was another purpose to me writing those because i you know i was kicked out of school when i was 15 didn't go to college or university i've never had a steady job and a boss and so i thought why don't i try and write summit <laughs> you're a storyteller it should come naturally shouldn't you does it feel like it should come naturally to you or yeah but it, it was about i didn't know whether i had the discipline to sit mm. down from sort of nine till five every day yeah and stay on top of a project like that you know music's pretty easy because i'm always working with somebody else so you can walk away from it for a little a little while while somebody else adds their fabulous ideas to it but actually sitting down and writing was a very um singular uh and sort of lonely thing and it did strange things to my head but anyway what i learned was even though i have no academic thing about me was i can sit down monday to friday nine to five or nine till quarter to six because the pub opened at six <laughs> uh and do this and i and i each book was like three months at a time and uh and then researching things checking all the details and i'm getting right and thankfully there was a lot on the on the internet to be able to check uh, all my facts against you know i might think i was in portland oregon in february 92 <laughs> but it was actually july 93. <laughs> um so so i so i proved that to myself you can do this so yeah. what i really wanted to do was i wanted to write a novel um so I did those three books, wrote about something that I knew about, which is what writer friends of mine said. And then the year after I sat down to start my novel, which in my head, I got it all. Uh, but after three chapters, I just felt like a complete <laughs> charlatan. I'm like, I'm not a writer. I'm not where, a writer. where did you start? First Sorry, at the beginning. First day, school. First day at school. Yeah. First memory coming out. <laughs> no, the, no, the novel was like, you know, introduce the characters. There yeah. were three three main characters that are at odds with each other. <laughs> so the first chapter is that person, next chapter is that person, yeah. and then the third chapter is that person, and then okay, chapter four, I've got to bring them together and start the narrative. Okay. And I haven't got a fucking. <laughs> like, how do I even do this? So uh, I abandoned that. I don't know. Maybe one day I'll go back. Maybe one day. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. Well, what, one thing that I did enjoy as well um, was the. The, you did a tour during lockdown of your house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and just uh, 
watching the and you know having no else to do being a fan of the wonder stuff seeing milo pop up on facebook and say i've got i'm just i'm doing a few tunes on saturday pop along if you want to um just th- those those gigs gave so much joy to a lot of people to join a shitty time how, how did you find it yourself that well i certainly didn't expect what what you just said i i didn't know mm. how much of uh one of many lifelines it was you know ian yeah. prowse was doing an amazing job on friday nights on mm. facebook as well and there were lots of other people doing it and as you say it was a shitty and strange time that none of us were prepared for some of us had less of a deal i i didn't have a difficult time i i like being on my own i live in the middle of nowhere uh i've said this many times the only thing that really changed for me was the pub shop um but not all my local mates we weren't going anywhere and so we just met in each other's gardens you know i'd do that thing at two o'clock on a saturday and then go around to my neighbors and sit in his garden with a couple of bottles of wine so we still kept our social thing going um so mental health wise, I was fine. Uh, it didn't interfere with any kind of work for me. And then doing those things from the couch or from the kitchen or from a little mm-hmm. studio room. Um, and then realizing Jesus Christ is like, I don't know, a thousand people mm-hmm. watching this. So I, I got all of that connection. Nothing like that was taken away from me. I actually prefer gigging from the lounge than I do traveling around the country for <laughs> okay. obvious reasons. Yeah. Um, and uh but it, what did it, it, what it, really weren't just all, it weren't just old people there old miles like me it were a lot of younger people there were getting involved with it and, and listening to the tunes for the first time i i found well only because their moms and dads were forcing them, to, them. <laughs> okay yeah. um, we're watching milo so get off anything else that's got an internet connection for the okay. next two hours uh but you're right yeah did a lot of young people but I, what was the, it was i would watch them back later on and, and look at the comments you know down the side and um and then other people were writing to me on messenger P- few people that i've met but other people that i'd never had any contact with before and the conditions that they were living under at that time were just fucking heartbreaking. I, I, I would sit here and be in tears reading uh, some of, the, you know, a, a fella died in the middle of one, one of my sets and his wife told me all about that. It was expected. Okay. And she wrote a beautiful note to me just saying that um, we knew he was going to go, but he went with you in the room and your music mm-hmm. and you're like, fucking hell. Jesus Christ, people are going through it. And so that those sort of connections were really valuable and re- unexpected and really surprised me how, how much we were helping each other out, really. Yeah, you, you, you've got to be proud of that, mate. I, I just think, you know, that people that go out of the way to do those type of things, like uh, John McClaw did quite a lot of that kind of stuff and Reverend the Makers, some of the kind of stuff and had similar reactions and uh-huh. it was just, uh, uh, you know, it, it helped me at the time, mate. So yeah, thank you. Oh, mate, thank you. It was, uh, it was a big spray. Well, my idea, it was my buddy, Phil Birchall, who does mm-hmm. our artwork and designed all the book, uh, artwork. Um, he was like, he'd seen someone do it. I don't think Prowsey had quite started then. And Phil was like, you should be doing this. I'm like, I don't know. And I still got all the anxiety like I do mm. on a gig day, but in my own house. And and then the way people, I was walking through Shrewsbury the day before yesterday and a, a, a guy walked towards me and just went, the Winkster! And start, <laughs> started playing with my dog. And he goes, yeah, man, he's rock star friend. And just played with Winkster and then wandered off. And I'm yeah. like, what just happened? And I'm like, oh, of course, the Winkster was always there yeah. on those Facebook things. So that's, you know, really sweet. Um, but yeah, it's my pal Phil's idea, but I was, I was really glad I did it. I was really glad I did it, yeah. Yeah, man. So the last ever solo album by Miles Hunt then. So the solo album comes out on the 7th of October. I'm putting a link in this description for people to pop onto their Wonder Stuff store and treat mm-hmm. themselves to it. Um, the tour starts on the 15th of October. I'm coming to the Bass gig in Stockport. Okay. I'm to listen to a few tunes, mate. Really looking forward to it. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I, I listened to uh, Tom uh, uh, from your team sent me the album to have a listen to yesterday. And, and I had a really good listen to it. And he sent me some information from you as well, like a note from you that I read after. And that's when I first learned that this could potentially be your last album. I, I, read, I read that as like your last, uh, last voyage into music. I know you mentioned earlier, you might still do wonderful things, but is it, but 
it kind of changed. I had to go back and listen to the album again when I realized it could be your last ever one. Mm -hmm. And it changed the way I felt about the album when I listened to it again. Um, and on the cover of it, you've got your arms out looking for a hug, it looks like. <laughs> I think it looks like me falling away. Oh, okay. Fair enough. Right. And then the guys at work, because I've been moving these nine gallon barrels around, they said, <laughs> you, you should have put a barrel on the back. It looks like you're catching a barrel in a pub cellar. <laughs> well, I, I listened to it the first time thinking, you know, the album's called Things Can Change, thinking this is going to be more optimistic. You know, Miles is back. He's got this album. He's going to be all opt op optimistic. Uh, so I listened to it, like, with optimism in my eyes and then i read the note before i listened to it again thinking this could be the last one i think it is up, i think it okay. is optimistic because yeah. all i'm doing is welcoming change you know yeah. it, okay that, sure. that that's it so you know the opening song when i wrote i think the opening song was the for, first song i wrote for it so it's it's mm. called i used to want it all mm. which is really true you know i i used to live eat breathe shit, the wonder stuff you know it was the only thing that was ever on my mind all my poor ex-girlfriends all all got sidelined <laughs> you know the wonder stuff came first um and so that was how i lived very selfishly all the music has been for me yeah. uh, i'm really glad that other people have enjoyed it else i guess it would have all been pointless other than entertaining myself mm. and um but I don't, I don't feel like that anymore. I, I don't, you know, I, I walk four or five mile every day with my dog. And even up until 12 months ago, there were, there's always song ideas in my head. There's always beats in my head. There's always little lyric ideas and melodies. And I'm always grabbing the phone and, and the little voice recorder and, and so, you know, idea for song. Da, 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 this is what I'm thinking. This is what I've got. Um, and I haven't done that for over a year. I, I just don't. It, se it seems to have very naturally left me. And now wh whether that's forever or whether that's just for a, a shorter period of time, uh, that remains to be seen. But at the moment, and I've been feeling like this for a year. Um, yeah, I just it's it's good. It's good. Things have changed for me. There's a lot, a lot of other things I want to change. I want the Tory party gone. Yeah, me too. I, I, you know, <laughs> I, I want the horrible atmosphere of our part of the world to change into something more optimistic and better for people. Well, in, in your notes, Miles, you said it, it we're going to be called Everything's Worst. Yeah, yeah, because <laughs> me, me and my friends, everything's worse. That's what we would keep saying to each other. Is yeah. It, yeah, and we were talking about whatever subject it would be. But everything's worse, right? And yeah. that was the working title for the album originally. Yeah. Like, I'll make an album because everything's worse, because I truly <laughs> believe that. And uh, and then as I got into the songwriting, I'm like, well, they're not miserable songs. And, and the music, the, you know, the tone of the music isn't yeah. depressing. I think it's still as uplifting as anything else I've ever written. You know, you know, I, I, I really adored the song "Friendly Company" when that came out on our new yeah. album. I got that kind of vibe of the new album. That, that okay, kind of, that kind of optimism and you know, yeah. like brightness to the to the music and that yeah, kind of, that's yeah. where I found. That's it. one of my favourites, "Friendly Company." I love it. You know, um, I, I'm not sure there's anything on there so quite purposefully poppy, but yeah, it's. Um, I, I don't think there's anything grim about the record. I think it is if you just read the little bio note that I wrote that yeah. you, you can listen to it with different ears, you know? Yeah. Mm. Well, I, I liked it in my sights because you, you talk about, you know, there's, there's plenty of worse people than you offer in the world. Yeah. Exactly. The morning brings a new light and all that kind of stuff. So there, there is optimism there. Yeah. I just, I just felt a little bit sad when I read the notes after and said, mm, no more Milo. Okay. Yeah, I mean, as I say, before, but uh, <laughs> I'll gig. I just I can't be asked to make records anymore. <laughs> it just doesn't seem like there's any point. Well, whichever way you go with your decision, mate, it's always it's been a pleasure to have your music in my life throughout my you know forty odd years on this planet. Um, is there anything you want to say to the people that are considering coming to see you live or buying your album that haven't pressed the button yet? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not going out doing an album tour. It's not pushing all these new songs i'll do two maybe three yeah. uh from the new album but like the little set list idea i've got at the minute starts with unbearable and a wish away and uh i'll just take people through a a little walk down memory lane of songs yeah. from the last 30 or 40 years um yeah just me doing acoustic telling me stupid little anecdotes in between songs so i always welcome it when people shut yeah. the fuck up 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> I've been there when really. you told people to do that. Yeah. You might have even told me to do that once at some point. <laughs> well, that was the pleasure of doing the gigs from home. <laughs> Yeah, you know, like, people yeah. might have been talking to each other on on the uh, the message board, yeah. but I couldn't hear them, and that's just how I like it. <laughs> just how you like it. And uh, and then yeah, and then we'll be selling. I don't know if there'll be any vinyl left. I think we've done yeah. very very well on the pre orders, but mm. there might be some of the first few gigs and the CDs. And then I'm always happy to hang out at the little merch table and say hello, shake a paw, take a picture, all of that. So yeah. Yeah, well, Miles, if you don't mind, I'll put a pint in front of you at, in Stockport when I come and see you. And really appreciate <laughs> you for spending this time with us on the RGM podcast. Um, thanks, mate. Thanks for thanks for thanks for everything you've done and oh, created over the years. It's it's meant the world to me, mate. Thank you. Oh, thank you. It's very good, cool of you to say so. Cheers, Bob. Is that all right? Yeah, cool.